and it's going to let you know about the numb chin syndrome. Uh, reassuringly, for neurologists, it's not the sequelae of spending a long time sitting like the man in the statue. So numb chin syndrome uh, is essentially exactly what it sounds on the tin. And um, so it's mental nerve neuropathy. And um, so essentially, patients will complain of very localized sensory disturbance, either numbness or paresthesia, and um, in typically in the distribution of the mental nerve, which is from the lower lip uh, down to the angle of the jaw. Um, and this is typically unilateral, although in about 10% of cases, um, patients might have bilateral um, involvement. Um, so the mantle nerve obviously is a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, and it runs through a long bony canal through the mandible and exits um, through the mental foramen towards the end of, of the mandible. Typically, disturbance of the mental nerve function is due to dental cause. So more than 60% of cases of numb chin syndrome will have an obvious dental cause, whether that's uh, local infection, trauma, following a dental procedure or following local anaesthetic. However, um, there's lots of other non-dental causes of numb chin syndrome, which would be more interesting to neurologists. And um, so there's a typical list. So central causes, more, most commonly demyelination and most commonly MS. Um, and then the other um, culprits of peripheral neuropathy or, or cranial neuropathy um, might be implicated in numb chin syndrome. But the thing that really um, people should be aware of with, with numb chin syndrome and the thing that, that rang about for me when I was taking this call over the weekend uh, was that there's a significant association with malignancy presenting with numb chin. Um, and in a small case series, 22% of patients presenting with numb chin as an isolated symptom um, had a malignant etiology for that. I think in that case series, 63% were dental and the other 15% were um, inflammatory. And um, the one caveat to that is that um, they didn't have any idiopathic cases, which strikes me as a bit odd. And um, so they managed to get a diagnosis for every patient in that case series. Um, which I don't think would be our typical experience in clinical practice. In terms of the malignant causes of thumb chin syndrome, so most commonly it is metastatic solid malignancy, and um, typically this is breast or prostate, um, but pretty much all of the solid malignancies have been associated with sm small numbers of cases of, of the numb chin syndrome. Um, and second commonest would be lymphoma, and um, so about 25% would be lymphoma, um, and less and less commonly leukemia, myeloma. And I think it's important that to, to know that in the context of malignancy, patients presenting with a numb chin um, it can be a significant finding. So in patients who don't have a known cancer, who are found to have a known cancer, 27% of those patients had numb chin as their first um, presenting symptom of cancer. So it might be the first symptom. So um, in the absence of any other systemic upset, you wouldn't rule out malignancy in a patient who's got an isolated numb chin. And in patients who have a known previous malignancy that's been treated, um, who end up with numb chin syndrome. In 37% of those patients, it's their first symptom of a recurrence of malignancy. And um, so really, um, I think these numbers just say, it's not one of these things that we should shrug and say, you don't know what it is. It's something that we should, probably should be investigating. So in terms of recommendations, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, so firstly, they should have a dental review um, and certainly ask about dental symptoms, common things being common. That's probably the, the likely cause for them, <coughs> numb chin. But in patients where we don't find a dental cause, uh, we should do some assessment to try and exclude malignancy and um, so particularly blood tests particularly looking at the hematological profile and, and bone profile for any body metastasis imaging to have a look for any um, solid lesions or leptomeningeal disease so typically contrast mri would be helpful um, and ct might be more helpful in assessing for body lesions of the mandible and base of skull sorry i've got something stuck in the back of my throat there <laughs> Um, and in selected patients where you've got a higher degree of suspicion, you might want to think about um, doing more systemic imaging or, or looking at CSF from malignant cells. Probably not in, in all cases, but I think in patients where there's um, something else going on or, or some other marker that's non-specific on the blood tests, make you think there could be something underlying and you may want to investigate further. Um, and finally, in patients who do have a malignancy, the presence of an gene is a poor prognostic sign. So in most of the case series that I've read, um, most patients who presented with an gene had an adverse prognosis and many died within a year of presenting with, with an gene. Um, and that's the end.